Yeah, recording in progress. It's starting to become a ritualistic thing of mine, Chris, to hit record and not have an hour-long conversation for no reason that I can't share with the world. So congratulations on being part of a 41-year-old guy keeping his mind slightly enough together to hit the record button so I can uh, share this beautiful conversation. People, if you don't know this guy, this is the great and powerful, the almighty Christopher Schmelke. You may have seen his face around Creation Entertainment's convention circuit and probably my arms around his neck in a lovely <laughs> brotherly embrace as uh, he's essentially my brother from another and my savior for the last 15 years on the road. Schmelke, how the hell you doing? How many earthquakes we having out there? No, it's crazy out here. Uh, earthquake day. Uh, today's eclipse day, so it's it's basically just a new. Uh, oh yeah. Nineties disaster movie every day over here. <laughs> <laughs> but at least it's something new, right? I mean, it's like something going on. I feel like. So the earthquakes. I, I mean, L.A. in the last two years has had enough rain. I think they said it's the second most amount of rain since recorded history of recorded weather in California in like the mid 1800s in the last two years. Now it's like the other day it's it's hailing, it's sleeting, it's snowing in L.A., Jersey and, and Manhattan and are having earthquakes like I, I don't know what's happening to the world or is this just how it unfolds, right? Is this just a blip? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I had a vague memory of a, you know, an earthquake when I was from when I was younger, but you know, like anything else, you know, sometimes our memories from the past are may have been a dream, honestly, you know, because I swore I'd lived in, through an earthquake before. But um, I was I was by myself. I was home. Um, I was on my couch, started shaking. Kind of thought it was the uh, you know washing machine exploding or something, but yeah. um, it was a good, good ten seconds, and then. Um, immediately after my phone rang and my mother-in-law is, uh, my wife is from Greece, as you know. Um, so she's from one of the Greek islands that had a major earthquake in the fifties that destroyed um, a large part of the north of the island from the architecture. Um, so her wow. mother, her mother lived through it and was there obviously. So she immediately with any earthquake, she assumes it's the same one in Greece and it's destroying my son's school. Uh, that's oh. her first so <laughs> that's was terrifying ready. man was ready to send she's like you gotta go to and i'm not gonna do the greek accent but uh you gotta go to the school save spiro he's falling in the abyss like she just thought the end of the world so um you know i called his school and and he was fine the schools were fine um but yeah but it's scary was you know, it did you have things did anything fall over in your place or did you just feel that rumble of the earth no, I like that. But there was someone put a picture in and, and their lawn chair was knocked over and they said, we will rebuild <laughs> the aftermath. <laughs> um, you know, not the, to, not to, you know the, there's so many hellish earthquakes that people have to deal with and and and, and some you know, obviously are worse than others. But um, yeah, no, it was fine. Yeah, uh, I mean, the natural disasters, I think, what was it, Taiwan last week had like a seven and a half, like back to back, some buildings falling over. It is, it is frightening, it is terrifying, but if anything, if anything, if there's a silver lining of these disasters, it's that life isn't happening on our fucking social media. It's yeah. happening out there, and we are but a little blip on the timeline of of world history that can either exist or be wiped out so don't live in yesterday don't pray so much for tomorrow let's be right here right now in this moment because hey who knows maybe we get a 20.5 earthquake that rocks the whole globe and tosses us out to pluto i don't know i i you know my motto as you know i think we have similar you know life mottos as you know as a uh as statesmen as we are but the the um my, my point in 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 life is to do what makes you happy really every day um you know focus on what makes you happy you know to uh drown out as best you can the the negativity and the negative energy in the world um you know and if i can make someone happy um i take advantage of it because i think that's that's the for me it's the way i like to be you know i like to live to be um you know, part of humanity to to respect each other, you know, and I mean, that's lost these days sometimes, but do you ever feel and I get this feeling sometimes where I feel a little selfish by by wanting to pick myself up by helping others sometimes like sometimes I'll get to this point where I'm like, man, I just 
I want to do for others because I'm in a hole and I, and I need to feel good. And, and literally doing, and this is, I'm sure there's some science behind it, but doing for others or gifting some uh, 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 ability or even a gift, an actual material, gift, like just doing something for others lifts you up in such a way. It just changes your spirit. And sometimes I feel like, am I doing it for them or am I doing it for me? Do you ever get that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's, I think it's natural, you know, to, because of, you know, doing something for someone makes you feel special, makes you feel better. And in turn, you feel that not that you're being judged by others, but that you judge yourself, you know, to say, I'm doing this. Am I doing it for the reasons that I think, you know, that it, that it, that it is it, at heart, it's, it's something to make someone happy, to make someone, you know, have one bright thing in their day that may not be the greatest, but um, I, I think that's natural, you know, I, and I don't, you know, I wouldn't overthink that, you know, if you, if it, you're doing something and whatever it is, and if it's benefiting someone in any way, then it's worth doing, you know, and however, the guilt that you might feel that you're doing it for the wrong reason, I, I think just kind of put that shit on the back burner. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm not stopping it selfish or not. I'm, I, you know, being back and, and this is a perfect segue into kind of the convention world for us to brag and talk on it a little bit, but, you know, coming off so many years of kind of COVID and inactivity on the convention circuit and being busy with a job here in Hollywood, you know, the ups and downs from my personal ups and downs to my marriage ups and downs to my parenting ups and downs, just everything felt out of control and, and wrong and weird. And just getting back, we've done two, I've done two conventions this year and man, it has filled me up. I cannot wait to get back with the people, you know, if there's something to be said for the division, that kind of uh, the, the, the COVID lockdowns and, and this and that and the different things made you feel. And then you think, oh, wow, I'm at home and I got nowhere to be but at home. And so you really feel good for a little while. And then all of a sudden a year goes by and then two years and you're realizing something's missing out of my life, my, my sense of community. And I, you know, I talked about this with uh, Brianna last week. Um, there is a documentary on Netflix. I think it's called The Blue Zone. And it's basically about people that live in, in these communities up to 100 or, or over 100. And my wife and I watch it together. And, and she really took away the, the nutrition side of it, right? There was all these different nutrition factors. And I'm like, wait a minute, the thing that they're mainly talking about is a sense of community and a sense of having an ability to walk outside or go to a place and be with people and talk and laugh and cry and hug and fight and embrace, like all the things that you need as a human being come from community and without community, you're lost in the world. Even if your community is just your family, you still need to exercise the ability to have more people in your life and bring happiness to them and allow them to bring happiness to you. And so for me, man, being back at these conventions, being back with you, just you and I in the photo room, and you know, we only get these five, 10 minute sections of time throughout this chaotic day to talk, but man, I value that like a mini podcast, like a mini therapy session. It's so wonderful just to connect, just to connect with your community, that being the supernatural fandom, the creation crew, you, the actors, all these people. That has been my community for so long. I'm just so grateful to have it back, man. It's, it's oh, wild. We, we spoke and, you know, not to, to reiterate, reiterate um, again, but it's, it's, you know, you are you know, to me, obviously, you know, family. Um, and also there was, you know, Matt missing, MIA, you know, when we came back, you know, I, I, I don't, I never take what I, my position for granted in the sense that, um, you know, you know, a lot of the actors, they, they're not at every single one, you know, yeah. and, and I have been, I've been at every single one since they started. So um, we're coming up to the 150th, which is insane. Um, you know, that's but, madness, you know, man. Going on 15 years, dude. So <laughs> it's uh, my Cal Ripken streak lives on. But um, it, it, you know, there was a whole when you weren't there for me. And I know for a lot of the other actors and the fans too, you know, it's, um, you know, you are part of like the, you know, if you were to look at the conventions as a Voltron, you know, giant organism walking around, 
um, you're part of the heart of it. You know, you were integral to what it is today and, and the growth from where it was, um, you know, and that I consider, you know, you, Rich, Rob and the band, you know, just the kind of unsung heroes in a way, you know, not the, you know, the, all the, you know, obviously we don't get all the attention, but we don't want that, you know, it's just that we're all part of something so incredible and, you know, that grew organically from, from a, from a convention, um, you know, driven by the fans to become something as special as we know it is. Um, yeah. can explain, you know, to fans that, that, that don't get to come, you know, I feel in a way, um, you know, that the photos that I take can kind of make people feel like they were there in a way. And I think, you know, a lot of the fandom who've gotten into photography and have said, you know, they were influenced by, um, by me or Megan or, you know, who is, um, who I miss by the way, Megan. In I know, uh, don't we miss her greatly. Uh, but, you know, they were influenced by photography to get into it. And that is the ultimate compliment, you know, that you could, you know, do something creatively that would influence someone to want to take an interest in it and do it themselves, you know? Yeah, um, man. It's, it's, so, so it's unique, you know, I mean, I think during, you know, COVID, cause you didn't come back right away after. So those first, you know, year and a half when we had the, the plexiglass in the room, you know, as, as awkward as that was, it was still just to be together with everyone again, you know, as far as like, you know, the, the, the girls, the handlers, you know, Magdiel, who I work, worked with for over 10 years, um, you know, and just, you know, sick of seeing everyone on Zoom calls, you know, to just finally see each other again. My first show back we did uh, with Star Trek in Vegas, and it was August, so it was 100, over 100 degrees out. Uh, we couldn't do photos inside without having a mask on. That was like the, the law. Um, so when I landed, they switched where I, the fire department had switched to have me outside. So they had to get a tent for 110 degrees out. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, listen, you just said so many things I want to touch on, and I can only start right here. I know the amount of effort you put into getting a quality photo photo for these people. Like, it is a physical, your body works as a tripod and a dolly and a techno crane all at once. Luckily, you're a tall guy. You have the ability to do a long six-foot lunge and get in there or get back here or get up there or get down there. And I could just imagine seeing you sweating your ass off out there in the Vegas oven, man. I had my I had my wire. We had we had power out there too, but I, I did have my wireless speakers. Um, you know, I'll always have music going on, even if I have to sing, but uh, which would be a nightmare. But the uh, <laughs> you know having Shatner out there and a hundred degrees in this in this tent with tumble literally tumbleweeds coming in the in the photo tent. Um, it was basically a little meth lab. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, all these things. And I, and I was still, I was like, you know what, fuck, fuck it. I'm glad to be back. I, I just, to see everyone again, um, to know that there was, you know, light, you know, in the, at the end, you know, because, you know, I think we all had periods of, of thinking, you know, was it ever going to end? You know, so it's like, it feels feels weird talking about it now because it seems like it was like 100 years ago, but it was, you know, it wasn't that long ago, but it just seems, I think it's, you know, we, we're definitely all in, uh, you know, trauma, you know, from, you know, with a PTSD from uh, lack of, you know, contact. It was just basically we were, we were locked in a, an island in a cave by ourselves with our families. Um, um, and luckily, I mean, I, we were all together. So that's, that's the positive on that. Is that, yeah. I, that time yeah. that, that we had, you know, with our families, you know, might not ever happen again with to that extent of being together for that long. Um, you know, just and, and with my kids and the ages they were, it was just, you know, we went to the beach almost every day. Um, you know, just again, make the best of it, you know, make the best of whatever the situation is that you can. I feel like there's always some sort of silver lining if you allow yourself to see it that way, you know, I mean, even in the worst of circumstances, something good, a lesson, a, a you know, a learning experience can come out of it. Um, you mentioned something earlier, I can't let it fly by, but you said, you know, me, Rich, Rob and the band being a in integral part of uh, creation and building the shows. It it's funny. 
I agree with you. I, you know, we were all there in the early days when it was the wild west of mm -hmm. figuring it out and trying to come up with a way to entertain people where it didn't feel like we were just taking their money. And it really became a love fest. And in turn of us building, trying to help build creation and what it is today, it also built me and it also built us and it taught me to be an entertainer without any preparation to grab a microphone and entertain a group of people is such a gift. It obviously led to me being discovered for entertainment tonight and winning four Emmys. Like I, I, I'm not bragging or boasting or trying to be a narcissist, but without creation and without that fandom allowing me to be this goofy weirdo that I am, that I'm finally in my thirties and into my, my early forties have become comfortable in being, you know, it was, it was, it was, they're responsible for it. Like the fan base is responsible for allowing me to be me, which they say the hardest thing you can do in life is be yourself. You know, it's one of the hardest things. I think, I, I think, you know, for me and others and you, you know, what you just mentioned to touch on, um, you know, it feeds into, um, you know, trying something new and, and the, the key you know, I think that could be adapted to any part of life is confidence in yourself, you know, to be confident in what you're doing. Um, you know, I preach this to someone asks about, you know, photography and, uh, you know, how do I get better? You know, first learn the craft, you know, first learn the technical side of it and then get to a point where it becomes second nature and becomes just a part of you, you know, and, and that could be music, that could be art, that could be, you know, what you mentioned about entertaining on stage, you know, having a, uh, you know, being on stage in front of people, my son, my little guy, he's, uh, he's great speaking in front of people. Um, my older son, who's in college, he uh, wasn't as confident at the time when he was his age. So the contrast between them, um, you know, you like to think that you had something to do with it just to, to, to let them know, just be confident in yourself to look people in the eyes to, um, you know, believe in what you're saying, you know, and, and to, yeah. um, you know, when you're doing something to take your time, you know, patience, it's a, it's a, you know, cliche sometimes, but, you know, to say what our grandparents told us, but, um, you know, when you do something, you know, treat it like it's the last time it's going to be done. Yeah. Something. Yeah. And, and I always say, and I, this is a Jay-Z thing. I heard him say when he was a young guy, but approach every album or, or, or every experience, every job, every artistic thing, as it's the first time you're doing it, like be jacked up that you have this opportunity Be So bring all your energy. And, and I'm a guy who's made a career off of energy and enthusiasm because what I've lacked in skill, I've brought the energy. And if I had the energy, I could learn as I go and also be enough of a leader through my my energetic abilities to to bring people with me and that's been so great speaking of bringing people with them and evolution of creation and what it's given all of us just this last uh convention in burbank i had the fortunate chance to walk out and join you in a very full chris schmelke photography session class whatever whatever you title it but man it's so impressive to see a group of people and a guy like you standing in front of them, teaching them your ways. And I, I think it's amazing. How did that happen? How did that come about? And are you enjoying that? Are you enjoying? Yeah, I, you know, creation for, for probably a year was asking if I would be interested in doing, you know, they had, I guess, messages from fans that, um, you know, wanted to actually hear me speak, which I was amazed by, uh, who the hell would want to hear me say anything, but, uh, you know, realizing, you know, what, what we were talking about before, you know, with, with, um, you know, how many fans were influenced by other photographers in the, within the fandom to say, I, it's something I'm interested in doing. It's something I want to learn. Um, and I, you know, I think our personalities are, you know, the things we know and the things that we're passionate about, we love to talk about it. You know, we'd love to share it. And if we could, if I could influence someone, you know, to that maybe, you know, had picked up a camera 10 years ago and, and then put it down and never picked it up again. Um, you know, if they could see something I did or hear something I said to be influenced to do it again, like what, what better, what better thing is there that you Nothing. could, you know, that is it. someone that, you know, that they could do it and, and adapt it to whatever they're interested in, whatever they're passionate about. Um, you know, it started as kind of a, you know, a class and I would, ask you know a lot of the fans like what would they want to see me see as far as editing and things like that and i um 
you know, Magdiel actually had my buddy, he does all the, the printing, you know, uh, just so everyone knows. Um, Magdiel is a uh, amazing photographer, but he had uh, brought up to me, he said, you know, would the fans be interested in, in doing, you know, headshots? And, you know, I, I thought about it for a second and I, and I was, I, I said, I, I think a lot of the issues would be that a lot of photographers and anyone in general doesn't like having their picture taken. Mm. So it's, uh, Burbank was the first one that we were kind of seeing how it went. Um, and a couple of the fans, they didn't want to do the photos. And I said, you don't have to, obviously it's, it's, you could just be part of it just to be out there. Um, the initial discussion was to bring a, a couple out at a time, but I said, I think it'd be best for everyone to be there, you know, just to see how it went. And it turned into everyone kind of, you know, getting excited to, to, uh, to, for the, for the fans doing it to say, you know, you're doing great, you know, just kind yeah. of encouragement and the fans that didn't want to do it ended up doing it you know, from being part of it, you know, to see. Um, so, it, you know, being, you know, it goes back to confidence, you know, and it's, you know, if you're confident with the camera, anything that benefits your confidence is going to make you better in, in behind the camera. So if you're com more comfortable having your picture taken, I think ultimately it's going to make you a better photographer. Um, so, it, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the motto, not motto, but I guess the theme of the point of what I was doing was, was just a confidence builder, you know, to say, uh, you know, whatever, we all have issues, you know, we all have something that we don't like about ourselves. Uh, while at the same time, you know, I think when you overthink it, it makes it a hundred times worse than it is, than it is, which it isn't bad at all. But, you know, you convince yourself that it's, it's something that it isn't. And to be, you know, part of that in and feeding off the energy of everyone there kind of cheering each other on uh when you came you know rich and, and billy had stopped by so it was a great just kind of being outside and you know which i love being you know i always prefer to be you know shooting outside all our pictures that we do yeah. we're always outside you know just to get out of you know the closed environment and just to be free outside to do whatever you want and it's just you know again it's just it goes back into, you know, making the best of a situation, but it's, you know, I think the key with photography, especially portraits is, you know, you have no control outdoors over the lighting or, uh, you know, all you have control of is where you are. So I just, I think the key of, uh, for what I do is to not get stuck in one's position to just be comfortable with moving around as you do it. So kind of, which is kind of how I work indoors also, you know, as far as, you know, you mentioned about energy, you know, I, I kind of, I'm like the, the conduit, I, you know, for the photo room itself. Um, and if I was just in a stool kind of slunched over, just clicking a button, I think that would kind of kill a lot of the, you know, the fun of, of what it is. And I don't say like, oh God, you know, if I'm not energetic, it's not going to be good, but it's just how, I, how it's just how I am. I can't work any other way besides yeah. moving around. And it, it is <clears throat> infectious walking into the photo room and you have a soundtrack for everybody going, you have fans going, so it's comfortable. You have gum and hand sand, all these things to make people comfortable. And it kind of the photos, people are excited to get into the schmelky room. You know, it's not like, oh, we're going to take a photo. It's let's go see Chris in the photo room. And it's really awesome. And you know what you deliver for the people is a is a memory that's priceless i mean there's there's no amount of money that can really be e equivalent to what you're getting back from your product it's such a happy moment it's such an embraceful love fest in there um I, I, something you said earlier about people not wanting to have their picture taken but then by getting their picture taken and being on the other side on both sides of the camera you learn in comparison, I, I say my, my acting career, right? I, you know, in the last five or seven years became a director and through directing and getting on the other side of the camera, you become a, a significantly better actor and vice versa, a, a, a better director by acting and understanding how to talk to the actors and what the actors want to be told. And I think it's so important what you're doing with the photography class because you're you're giving these people a, a condensed version of photo school that could take four years or even more and 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 not just school because right like 
school is school. You have to learn how to work the camera. You got to learn the F stops and the apertures and all these different things. But then hands-on experience could take you 10 years to get that comfortable. You throw a group of 20, 30, 40, however many people you're doing these classes for. And then all of a sudden their hands-on experience in the moment is jumping them ahead tenfold. It's really, it's really brilliant and beautiful that that creation and, and you have teamed up to kind of make this happen. And we are, it is exactly what we do in the supernatural family is give back. And, and even though people may be paying to be there, they're receiving tenfold in what they're paying for. The experience of you, like you said, me, Rich, or, or me, uh, Rich and Billy stopping by and being involved. It's, this is a, a, an experience that's unmatched and you're not going to get at any university or college or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, I think I didn't. Awesome. Um, I, didn't uh, I didn't go to school for photography, but uh, my dad was a photographer, so he was, um, you know, he a photographer in the Navy in uh, Vietnam. So uh, from the I think sixty six to sixty early sixty nine, um, he came back and eloped with my mom in Montreal. Um, I think in seventy two. Um, so I grew up in you know his dark room and in the basement. Um, you know, it was a, like one of his, my dad's basement is basically, it feels like a, like a Chernobyl bunker. It's just concrete <laughs> everywhere. Um, you know, I grew up, you know, I was an only, I'm an only kid. So my cat was my sister, but my dad uh, went through spurts of various hobbies. And when he would become interested in something, he would go completely apeshit into it. Um, started, you know, my earliest memory was, was, uh, like he built a train set in my basement, which I, I think I showed you pictures of it. Um, the station breaks album cover is like a, one of the guys on the train set. Um, it takes up literally half the basement. It took him six years to build it. Um, he was an electrician. So he'd come home at three or four, uh, from like eight to midnight every day. He built this city, which is, um, so detailed, um, like scary detailed, like serial killer detailed. It's <laughs> um, amazing, I'll have, dude. I'll have a guy on a mountain uh, with binoculars and he's looking in a direction and you're like, oh, look at this little dude with the binoculars. They're like pea small, these little guys he painted. Um, and if you beam where his vision is of his binoculars, it's girls sunbathing on a roof across the town. Yeah, so, that's incredible an alligator coming out of the sewer like just like little like such a small part of this little city um and then it went into radio control cars and then boats and then uh you know lizards iguanas he's had um you know japanese koi fish in the yard uh we had 30 turtles in the yard at one time um you know so i grew up with all these exotic animals and everything else but uh in the in the dark room in this basement you know it was pictures of like his vacations with my mom me as a baby um you know, driving in Germany in, in, in the 70s with my mom on a vacation, and then, uh, you know, bodies in a lime pit from Vietnam. Wow. So that contrast is, you know, obviously, you know, the dark room is lost as today is what it kind of what it was, which was, you know, kind of magical sometimes to see blank pieces of paper slowly become something and you could see it as it's happening, you know, it's, that's kind of lost, but, um, you know, I think the trade-off with with the chemical inhalants that we dealt with in the darkroom stuff is is worth the trade-off now. Um, and also for a photo, what I do, like I imagine that with film, like come back, guys, in two weeks, we'll have your prints ready. <laughs> That's it's listen. Developing film is one of the coolest things. In my high school, I was I was lucky enough to have this teacher named Mrs. Brock and. Before I graduated, they, my high school had built a dark room and we were all taught to develop film and blow up pictures and just everything, you know, the amount of, you know, time you leave it in to underexpose or overexpose and then you put it in the next solution. I was infatuated by it. Um, and also, I don't want to let it pass. When we're in New Jersey, I'm going to try to come early and I don't know if it's going to be a possibility, but I would love to shoot some stuff of your dad's model set um, mm -hmm. with the intent to narrate it and make a story out of it. Because just you telling it to me is creating a story in my mind. So my, my vision with it is, you know, to use it, you know, I mentioned about, you know, because 
uh, for station breaks, we use they use the cover, and it kind of gave me an idea as far as incorporating it into uh, like a music video kind of situation. Not with the but not with the the figures coming alive, but um, you know, getting I have a I got a really small camera that my ultimate plan is to get it operational to the point that I could mount the camera on a train and drive it slowly through the town because the town was built I think you finished it probably in in 88 so we're going on almost 40 years old um you know it's my dad's up there a little bit in age now so he's not you know conducting the trains anymore on the set but it uh, basically looks like an atomic bomb went off in the town so everything is is still wired everything is operational but it's just everything is covered in like three inches of dust and yeah. you know knocked over the, the the mailman is like on his side with the mail up in the air the, all the cars are tilted over like i don't even know who did all you know i may have played with them when i was younger and then never put them back but um you know the train going slowly through this town through town he's got tunnels built out of paper mache mountains um you know wallpaper of like you know the sky is all in the background so if you look at it from afar um it looks just like a city in complete disarray but when you get into it you could really appreciate the details that it has while at the same time you know just the the you know kind of echoing you know us as humans you know on, on how nature takes back you know things that are left you know or abandoned so it's uh you know it means a lot to me because of of what it meant to him and and how long it took him to build it and how I was part of it with him he let me build certain little things on it um you know it's kind of a big project that we did together you know and I was part of so uh having that train go through there is kind of will kind of be I think really special to see it all close up yeah and yeah, you know we, we'll we'll definitely have to go over there with the like macro lenses and the, the of the you know the adaptive lenses that they can put on on cameras nowadays, we could make something really really unique and tell some kind of story there. And if it's a music video, let's let's make a music video. I mean, whatever. I'm gonna text you. Uh, I'm gonna text you a link because he's got a uh, a site up with uh, like his pictures from from when he cleaned it up. So, but awesome. that, imagine that was 25 years ago. So a lot of time has gone by, and I, I think what happened was. I did a, a photo macros, like you mentioned, I did a macro lens with wireless flashes. And um, I had a little show with the, the prints from it. That was over 20 years ago. When he saw what the state of it was up close, he got it kind of inspired to clean it up. And when he didn't tell me he was doing it, because I was planning to do like a whole other sequence of photos, like just based on just the destruction of, of the town. Um, so he cleaned it up and I told him, I said, dad, you ruined my, ruined my art, man. <laughs> like cleaning it up. But now it's, it's gotten to that point again, where it's, it's ready to, uh, you know, it has that same feeling of, of just, just like a town gone wrong. Cause it was like, like trains. Like, if you think about it, like it was, that was a huge hobby in like the sixties and seventies for people. Yeah. Um, you know, like all these trains, there was like train stores in every town, like to buy little model trains and wear your little conductor hat and toot toot, like ring the bell or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, you know, it, it's kind of capturing that, that spirit of, of what the hobby was, you know, and what it meant to people to kind of live in this other world, you know? And yeah. Build they built it. And that's probably what it was for your dad. Like some dads just have to go to the corner bar and have beers to escape whatever it is and have their moment of time. And for your dad, it probably, you know, he would really escape into this story, you know, in his mind, yeah, it was cool. pr probably a movie he was directing, you know, mm -hmm. and that's pretty awesome, man, that you have a piece of that that still exists. Yeah, he didn't drink. So that was his, that definitely was, you know, his escape, you know, plus he, you know, my parents didn't get along. So that was another thing, you know, that he's in the, the Chernobyl bunker <laughs> building its secret little world, you know. <laughs> Listen, whatever you got to do to get by, you know, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. And I, life... say, you, I can, it's, it's hard to put into words, but when you see it in person, you'll, you'll get a, a gauge on, on how big this thing is. It's kind of crazy. You know, I, it reminds me of something that I love very, very much in this world. And that is the movie Beetlejuice, uh, which I know you've seen. There's a mini set in this, um, you know, that I guess Beetlejuice exists in the Michael Keaton character exists in. And just the other day, 
they released a trailer for a sequel with the same cast. Have you seen this yet? No, I haven't seen it yet. Dude, were you a Beetlejuice <laughs> fan, the original? And I, I mean, I, I liked it, but you know, I, I did see it in the movie theater when it came out. I've seen it again since. Um, I liked it. I didn't, I wouldn't say I loved, loved it. Yeah. You know, like I would be crazy over a sequel, but sure. uh, I'll definitely see it. Yeah, I just think it's so cool because I was like, I remember they, they, you know, they would have this little kind of town set up and, and, and when they showed the kind of close up angles on it, you could tell the different materials that they used to build this little city. And I thought it was so, just so freaking cool. So there's a, was a new trailer out and I was like, oh my gosh. And, um, Jen, well, Tim, is Jen Tim Burton Ortega, directing it? I think Tim Burton is directing it. And I think it's Jen Ortega, the girl from Wednesday that plays Wednesday is the daughter of, uh, uh what's her name the the yeah winona Ryder's daughter and i think maybe the husband passed away yeah i don't know i couldn't i don't know the storyline but it just looks cool to see michael keaton like i don't know 30 or 40 years later as the same guy the same way just as wild as and spunky and 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 unique as ever um well, tim, tim burton was uh you know is no notorious for you know he loves stop motion animation uh, which is kind of, you know, I think Blade Runner was the last movie that had all analog special effects, um, you know, kind of old school and didn't embrace any kind of digital stuff. Um, but it, I remember reading that. I don't know if that's true, but, um, you know, the, you know, Tim Burton, he's, he's, he loves the way things used to be done. And it's almost like, do you remember Viewmasters? Yeah. Um, like a lot of kids, they don't know or give a shit about, you know, view masses. It's, you know, it is what it is, but um, there was something magical about, you know, clicking the next one. And then if you went halfway, you could kind of see just a different way of looking at it. Um, you know, and I had a lot of weird, like kitty version, like stop motion animation stills of stuff. Um, that was another uh, show I was doing was I was blowing up the slides from Viewmasters into giant size prints. Awesome. Uh, you know, just to see it, because I mean, obviously it's not going to be the power of the Viewmaster of seeing things kind of in, um, you know, 3D. Um, but to just see, you know, it's kind of remembering kind of a lost, you know, childhood memories, you know, that, you know, we don't, a lot of us don't have the Viewmasters anymore, but to see these, you know, because they were so, when we're young, you know, these things stick in our, you know, get so deeply embedded in our brain, you know, things that that's probably mostly things that scare us. But uh, a lot of these like puppety kind of kitty shows like they're fucking terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> they are like to see those blown up, like with the, you know, the the jester, you know, it's always like clowns and, um, you know, the, the most terrifying just because it's like the smiley face on them. It's creepy as shit. But um, yeah, so I mean, the uh, the view masters kind of reminded me of just untouched technology that's, you know, something that's not used anymore. And um, just, yeah, you, know, you sound, sometimes sound like your grandparents, like, you know, the things I used to have back in my day. <laughs> We're all going to be our grandparents. There's no fight in it. And let me tell you something awesome about the Viewmaster. I don't know what the company is, but my recently in the last couple of years, my wife's grandmother has, uh, developed kind of early onset dementia. And so we had her 90th birthday party. And as a gift, my wife had one of those things made and they customized the discs and she had discs made of her young life, essentially. So we're sitting at this 90th birthday party, you know, just at a restaurant, just 10, 15 of us. And it gives her grandma this thing and she looks up into the light with awe in her face and is just snapping by and she sees a picture of her and her, her, you know, recently, you know, passed on husband and them as kids and then their kids as kids that are now 70 years old. And it was so awesome to see her pick it up and grab this thing because she's seen it before. Right. She probably gifted it to her, her son, my wife's dad, when he was a boy. And, uh, you know, she's just flipping through and crystal clear memories of every picture in there. It was just such a cool thing. So it's just so awesome that you brought that up because a lot of people have no idea what it is, but there is a company out there somewhere that'll make you custom, you know, the, the circle, I think they're circle, the discs that go in there. 
It's kind of the uh, the VR headsets of the 1930s. <laughs> that's that's what it is. 100%. You know, it's kind of you know, to, to it's one thing to look at an album or look on the screen, you know, but to see something where you see nothing else except the photos, um, you know, it's 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 special. Yeah. Speaking of dementia, my dad is going through, um, you know, or not, I'd say early to mid. Um, you know, anyone who's gone through it or or has family members, it's. Uh, it's sometimes a uh, painful thing to go through, but, yeah. um, you know, what I found with him, you know, and, and not that it works, you know, would work for anyone, obviously everyone's different, but, um, you know, he has such vivid memories of the past and just, I was over there last year. I, I was the first time I noticed it. And I, I was playing songs for him that he remembered, you know, with Fleetwood Mac and he was big into disco shit for some reason, but, um, <laughs> you know, playing him some I, I played him a disco song that I that I liked that I knew he knew um and he had a whole story from the night when he first heard it and at the at this corny disco club in New York um that he used to go to my, my mom he knew everything he knew what he had to drink that night he knew what what corny pants he was wearing um you know he had his focus the place was called focus for disco elegance was the name of the club um, <laughs> shit. he remembered it brought like the music brought back everything to him you know from from triggering the memories and and it's you know going back to the photo room like the music is uh you know so like honestly could not be done i couldn't do what i'm doing without it you know because yeah the the memories that are formed and the and the results after when when someone's looking at you know the photo sometimes you could hear the music or remember the song that was playing when you had your when you had your moment. Um, so for him to hear these songs and to relive that that moment, I I, I gave him my record, my other second record player, um, and I got all his disco albums out for him and his 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 Fleetwood Mac and um, you know all the, everything he had you know that I grew up with. Um, half of them I probably destroyed on my Fisher Price shitty record player, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, seeing him, you know, it's kind of been a great thing just for for him to have something to look forward to, you know, just to to be able to listen to music again. And, you know, because of the power of it, you know, of how it's almost not as powerful as smells, but it's up there with, you know, the memories and, um, you know, things that that it reminds you of. And yeah. Moments. And it, you know, music cr can create a character. I, you know, I've I've often like spoken to directors and they're like, oh, we want you to play this or that. And I'm like, I, I, a question I like to ask is, and, and not every director can answer this. It's more of like a movie director or somebody that's really, you know, spending time with the script. What, what music does this character listen to? Cause that really, you mm -hmm. know, if they tell you hip hop or country music, you're, you're, you know, you're developing two different characters there. And so, yeah, man, music sets a tone and shout out to all the great musicians and great uh, score makers of movies that, take a very mediocre or a very average movie and they set a, a soundtrack to it that grabs you by the guts and squeezes your heart into oblivion like that's music that's not yeah, necessarily that's like, just the imagery yeah that's uh you know you know by if, if i enjoy if i'm out of seeing a movie and i enjoy it you know i a lot of times i have to watch it again because i'm a lot of times i'm listening to the music the first time through you know i'm hearing um you know details in there and and just just seeing how much music adds to a scene you know and it could be a scene without any dialogue at all and yeah. music could also affect a scene with dialogue more than without you know or the opposite so i mean it's just there's so many uh you know amazing you know composers of scores and and just also music choices you know of i i did my wife she she wrote a couple of plays in college and we did one off broadway um I, I paid for the theater and, and the, uh, the sets and everything else. And we ended up breaking even, uh, but I had arranged all the music for it and just working with her and just seeing, you know, people's reaction to, you know, the music that I had picked for, it was for, for like end of scenes or to lead into intermission or anything else just related to the, the script. Um, you know, it's just, it's probably one of my things I'm most interested in doing as far as, you know, getting involved in, um, you know, soundtracks or, or whatever, you know, as far as music goes, that's one thing with COVID it's, you know, re-triggered my getting back into music and, and that is 
something I might not have done if I didn't have that time. So, you know, again, it goes back, you know, I think the theme is, you know, embrace the moment and, and to make the best of a situation that, you know, even if it's negative, you know, there's light and there's something that can come out of it that can help you for the rest of your life. Yeah. And it's that saying, right? It's that, that supernatural fandom saying of always keep fighting, which almost translates to just don't give up on yourself. Like no, no matter what it is, no matter what the hardship, just keep going and keep fighting for yourself and don't quit on yourself because I, you know, and I say this and I'm a believer in this because I'm a, I don't find myself a, a, like remarkably talented but I do have the ability to keep going and keep dreaming. I'm a guy that latches onto his dream and just I'm consistent with my approach and, and to, to keep on trying, you know, forever. And so my any success that I've had in my life just comes from not quitting. I don't think it's because, oh, my gosh, Matt Cohen is so capable of this and he's got this great ability just keeping going you're going to find that ability you're going to add to your ability you're going to grow your strengths through it but if you stop you never grow you know so you got to keep going and and like you said a, a hard circumstance is showing you another angle and that's my favorite thing about learning to be a director is that if this isn't working change your angle to something else and that is with everything in life if you didn't get the job you wanted if you didn't the photo didn't come out the way the the record didn't come out the way the whatever change your approach change your angle to it and man you'll be amazed at what what opens up if you just shift your perspective one way or the other and rather than close off and think ah this is a it's not working because this is the way i wanted it to and it's not happening open that spectrum up a little bit and, you know, really see what's there. It's the same thing with you in a headshot, right? Like you put your, put the subject in the headshot and then you go up. Oh, but if I move it where the headshot is more left or more right, you're going to see something different. It's going to become something. That's why uh, I, uh, yeah, no, no, definitely. Cause during the, I think that was a point I made during that, uh, right before you had come by was, you know, how different just six inches makes. Yeah. Um, that was weird, but. <laughs> um, I just realized that as I was saying that, um, but you know, to go, you know, further down or to, to move to your left or your right. And the point was to not get glued in a spot. And at the same time, you know, the next thing, you know, um, you know, big baseball nerd, I am, but, uh, you know, at the end of the game, if the team's winning, they bring in their closer pitcher to close out the game. Um, sometimes he blows it. Sometimes the lead is done and he loses the game the mentality that a closer has to have is to expect failure to not not embrace failure you know but to visualize first i think is whatever you're doing to know that you're going to you could succeed at doing it while at the same time if you don't to not let that affect the next time you're in that position which is you know a lot of you know there was a, a closer on uh, the Angels in the 80s and he blew one of the playoff games and he never got over it. So, you know, you could you could let something negative affect you and drag you down while at the same time you could embrace it and make you stronger the next time you're in that spot. So that's kind of how I go about things is just that meant kind of closer mentality to to know you, you're going to succeed. But if you have the chance that you don't, that there'll be another time. Yeah. And I mean, listen, that is, that is a great big basket of wisdom from you, Chris. And I think, I, I think it's important <laughs> that people hear it, you know, they've, you know, some people see people succeeding and think they've only had success. You know, they don't think that uh, Albert Einstein made 10,000 attempts at the light bulb before the light bulb happened. Right. And he never went, Oh, I failed. He said, I made 10,000 uh opportunities that didn't work that's it you know they those didn't work but the ten thousand and one or whatever number it fell on it worked and it was like holy shit i didn't give up and i didn't quit and now we have light right <laughs> and and imagine at the time like imagine how wild it was to think like oh i'm gonna turn on a glass bulb that's gonna illuminate a room or even more than that there's going to be a bulb over there plugged into a socket. I'm going to hit a switch over here and a light's going to go on. People probably thought those ideas were witchcraft. You know what I'm saying? Like, like Imagine, what? 
imagine 1900 and this is one of my favorite times in, in New York, um, like the early 1900s where there were horse and buggies with cars in the street at the same time. You know, they're still in Central Park, you drive next to the horse, I always feel bad, but, um, you know, that, that clash, that clashing of technology with, you know, the future and the past kind of coexisting, you know, in that short period of time before, you know, horse and buggies kind of faded out, um, you know, is, is kind of uh, intriguing to me forever. Um, just the coexistence of the past meeting the future, which I think is kind of probably stems from my, my grandmother used to work in an antique store. So I grew up in around antiques all the time. So just seeing and, you know, feeling something that someone had um, and what they did with it and its presence, you know, a hundred years before, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing to, to, to hold something as old as that and, and the memories it possesses, if it could talk. <laughs> and it's strange because we're all, we're at another precipice that is somewhat similar and, I believe they've stopped printing DVDs and CDs at this point. Like I just read oh, I something. I don't think, yeah, no, I think, cause actually CDs, like as far as music goes, have re kind of made a big boost in the last two years. Okay, so maybe um, it was DVDs that I read. I think, yeah, I mean, they're probably fading towards like the laser disc kind of pass, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember, again, back in my day, um, <laughs> there was an amazing DVD store in Long Island that was called uh, Laserland. Um, and I used to, you know, they had all the Criterion movies there all the time, which was, you know, just for me being in there and just seeing movies and just feeling them physically. And I, th I think it leads to, you know, a big attachment I have to, to records is that, you know, to feel it, to hold it in your hand and to, you know, physically handle it and put it on and then you're choosing where to put it. Um, you know, and my son, he's, he's 19, but, uh, he loves vinyl as much as I do just to, to have that physical connection. Cause a lot of times you, you're, you know, you're stream, obviously the streaming age we're in, I, I think even, you know, when MP3 started, it was probably, uh, late nineties, two thousands, as far as before iPods, you know, there were, uh, you know, just downloading files and, you know, there was no connection to the, to the artist when you don't see it you don't see them you just hear the music um you know to to feel it in your to have it in your hands and to open it up and again to handle it's just uh it's another level you know of connection to what makes vinyl as special as it is you know, I, I i remember getting cds when they first came out <clears throat> and i wanted to learn the lyrics of songs so you take out the little cd booklet and then in some of them would have all the lyrics and I would grab a piece of notebook paper and like my favorite hip hop song or whatever it was, I would start jotting down. Like there was like, you know, you, you bought the CD because you were like, what are the pictures? What am I going to see in that little CD booklet, which was so amazing. And speaking of vinyl, like vinyl is made a surge back into life in such a beautiful way, which brings me to, the fact that you gave me a Wu-Tang, I think it was 36 Chambers vinyl. And then I was with my hairdresser and she has a son that's like in his teen years. He's a Wu-Tang guy. And so I bought him a double, uh, you know, whatever the double album is, the Wu-Tang album. And But I did it because I remember how cool it felt to receive a Wu-Tang vinyl. And <laughs> I wanted to pass that on to somebody. And so he, I, he she just gave it. Uh, I that's just gave the greatest it to for, you know, for, for me in... Uh you know, junior and starting in junior high. And then especially in high school, when I started driving, I think I had a, I started driving at 16 because I had a permit to drive to work. I was working at creations comic book store. That was fucking like 35 years ago, dude. But That's incredible. Uh, so they, you know, I wasn't working there for them for 35 years because they moved to California and I was managing a computer company in Long Island. But, um, you know, when I was driving, you know, I was the only one in, in like my, class that had a car so all my friends were always like let's go here let's go to the beach let's go there um so i always had music playing and they would say like my friend would say oh i really i like that song because i always had a lot of weird taste but uh i would remember what everyone all my friends said they liked and then i would make them tapes with the songs that they heard in my car that they liked so they were all custom for my friends so you know doing the playlist for everyone now it's kind of just that graduated, you know, as far as, you know, just remembering what people like and, uh, you know, make it, like you said before, you know, just a, on 
you know, the icebreaker, you know, making people comfortable and how important that is, you know, if, especially in a short period of time, um, you know, you could be yourself, you could feel, uh, you know, confident that you, you, you don't have to worry about the technical side of what I'm doing, that you could just be yourself and do what you want to be, what you're comfortable doing uh, with everyone else. So that's, uh, that's the, the music background there. Well, <laughs> Listen, we need to do something creative together. You know, for the people that see this for the first time, we sh Chris and I recorded a podcast at the end of last year, but it had all sorts of technical difficulties. So we're following up. But I, I know we spoke about doing something and I, I don't know what exactly it is, but I'm for the rest of the creation cons, I will be bringing my brother who is part of my Cobros podcast. He's 21 and I'm 41. So it's really funny to examine anything and everything from his perspective and my perspective. So I was going to do some live podcasts in the vendor's room, you know, just for an hour sitting around and chatting and talking and inviting a fan in here or there. And then in addition to that, in the cities we go to, I want to make it more of a Anthony Bourdain type of no reservation show where we get a piece of the culture, right? So we hit the streets of New York, we find a restaurant, we find a local person, maybe somebody invites us to their house, we eat with their family, you know, just getting in contact with community. And I want to capitalize on the cities we're in with creation because I have to be there. And I, I want to bring my brother into the mix of it. So you and I need to come up with something to do. Um, I want to give people a behind the scenes look of, of conversations and art within the conventions, because there's so much brilliance and beauty going on from the conversations you and I have, or me and whoever, and you and whoever, and the way you you lift up a fan in a moment of crisis, or we do the same, or we lift up each other. And then just all the visuals that we share in these moments of joy and happiness, whether it's uh, us at top golf in Vegas as a crew out late at night, just hanging out, hitting golf balls, just being together. I want to allow people somehow to be a fly on the wall of some of these experiences and, uh, you know, put together a project that's maybe both video and photo involved. So, you know, moving forward, you and I should really approach it on top of, obviously we should do something with your dad's train set. Cause it's just so fun. Well, I'll take it. When you come, I'll take you there for sure. I'm coming. I, I'm, as I talked to Bree Bree and I are kicking around an idea to offer uh, the fans a little special experience, and we're going to maybe try to kick it off in New Jersey. I, we haven't talked too in-depth about it, so I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Um, but, yeah, I plan on coming in like Tuesday or Wednesday, you know, and, mm -hmm. and being there till Monday and maybe even staying a little longer and driving down to Jason Mann's is, uh, you know, or, or no, maybe that's D.C. Yeah, Monday, Monday after that show is, uh, I think, Swain and Jason in the city. Ah, that's what it was. Yeah, that Monday night. yeah so. that would be fun. So I think, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to hang out for a week. You can gladly sit on my roof of the car. Dude, I'd be happy to do it. I'd be happy to do it. Um, all right, we've been on here chatting for an hour. Let's get the hell out of here. I know you got stuff going on. I have to pretend I have stuff going on uh, so people think hey, I'm man, busy. I, I got an eclipse in two and a half hours. Oh, that's, that's right. What are you doing yeah, for the eclipse? So we only get a little portion of it here in LA. You're going to get like the Whopper. It's going to go like nighttime, right? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm like a quarter mile from the like the water and the, the, the uh, Throg's Neck Bridge. So the sun... Uh, there's a group of rocks that we go out on, um, you know, Spiro pretends he's a, a spear fisherman. Um, so we're going to go out on, on the rocks and just kind of see what the hell happens, man. Awesome. Well, hopefully some, hopefully some aliens land. Send me a video. Send me some pictures. I want to see what your view looks like. I'm definitely going to be filming it from the rooftop with my kid. I'm excited. We, we get it at like 2 to 2.15 p.m. We're going to get what little bit we get. But Oh, nice. I'm excited. I think, uh, yeah, don't don't look in the sun, with, and especially with the camera, because the camera. Forget about your eyes, but the camera will be destroyed if you yeah. don't have. A, you need like a solar lens on it. Um, you know, the solar glasses are like if you look through them, it's like having a blindfold on. Uh, <laughs> but <I've, laughs> somebody you know, that, shows, that, that shows how powerful you know the, the the light intensity is to you know once it's going on. So uh, right. I, I envision it like Indiana Jones, like. You know your face melts off if you look into it. <laughs> <laughs> Bali me shakti there. What does he say when he grabs his heart out? Lost, or, lost when they open the arc and everyone's face melts off. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, 
But I always say, Zach, Kalima Shakti Day. Oh that my was, gosh. I used to say that to my friends. I would just walk up to them in middle school and just grab their chest and start saying, Boom, boom. And he, <laughs> <laughs> he hard. <laughs> All right, Chris, I love you, big dog. I can't I wait to that. see you in Jersey. Thank you for sharing your time with me. Oh, we'll talk uh, and you, you'll be seeing that train set. You'll, you'll see the magic. Um, say goodbye to the people, but first let them know where they can find you. Can they find you on socials? Can they buy your prints anywhere? What's going on? Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of my prints that have never been offered, you know, you know, I would always, you know, occasionally for charities and stuff, I would, I would sell for like a holiday stuff. Um, but many times, you know, they just were never offered, you know, the photos that I've taken over the years. So, um, you know, besides the book, which is in, in production, not production, but it's in, you know, the, the stages of, you know, fruition. Development. Yeah. Uh, so many hurdles that I, I won't bore anyone with, but um, you know, a lot of the prints that, uh, like photos that I've taken of, of you, Jensen, the girls, you know, everyone down the line, um, are at creation conventions at the shows themselves. So, um, you know, pictures, uh, just an example, like Jensen's Twitter picture, I think has been that way for 12 years. That was one that I took just in probably like our photos that we do like yeah. 30 seconds and we just do it. And that's, that's how it goes. But um, so that, that, you know, many, many are offered at the, at the shows. I don't sell them otherwise uh, secondary, but, um, yeah, my, uh, my Twitter is Chris Schmelke, C-H-R-I-S-S-C-H-M-E-L-K-E. -E. Um, just one mention it's, uh, Krista's birthday today. Oh, and I know we, we brought her up. Um, you know, she, it meant so much to so many people. Um, so unique, so one of a kind, um, you know, and like the conventions where, you know, moments never happen again, you know, the moments that that I've had and that everyone that knows her has had with her um, will stay with us forever. You know, she um, she meant so much and as in kind of similar in the sense that she loved nothing more than making someone that wasn't there feel like they were, um, you know, she was always videotaping to share with the fans um you know that couldn't come that couldn't be there or wanted to relive something that they were part of um so you know happy birthday 40 i think she's 40 was 45 uh today um love her forever as i know yeah you yeah um krista was was more than a, a part of the family she was she was a, a person that extended herself to every single other person that couldn't be involved and made everybody feel like they had a home and she was a an arm and a shoulder to cry on for everybody and we you know when i first met krista so long ago we thought that somehow some way our parents may have slept together at some point because we looked so similar when she had the dark hair and the green eyes and and all that so happy birthday may you rest in peace you beautiful being we love you so much uh I'm so thankful that you brought that up because I, I would have missed uh, her birthday and that's not a date I want to miss. So now I'll save on, it on, on, calendar. on our, on our, on our previously uh, gone haywire one, we did mention her also. And I, and I knew it was, uh, you know, I was going to bring her up to today, obviously it's a special day and, and, you know, I know you do, I do anyone that knows her, you think about her all the time, you know, yeah. because of who she was and what she meant to, to people. Um, and she's kind of the spirit of what the the conventions that we do are, which is, you know, about, you know, a bigger picture than just coming to meet an actor. You know, it's coming to meet, you know, your friends for life that you met at a show, you know, yeah. or met online that you met, you know, for the first time. And, and you look forward to seeing your friends sometimes more than you do seeing any of the actors. So, um, you know, for me, like, and just to kind of group it together, it's, you know, there's not one... It's, it's almost, you know, we all have friends that, you know, maybe we didn't see them. And then when we see them, they say, why didn't you call, you know, with our group, including the fans, it's never about, you know, why didn't you call? It's I'm happy to see you again. And yeah. that is, you know, that's just genuine, you know, and that's, it's true, uh, you know, friendship to just say, you know, life is, you know, we all have our lives, you know, and, and it doesn't mean that we care less about someone if we don't call them every day it's just that you know we pick things up from where it was when we last saw them you know yeah. and that, that's the magic of of what it is that we do i think in a dude sense. 
well said and so beautiful and and you're 100 percent right even if we don't talk every day when you when we get around each other both both the fans from the conventions the 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 talent the circumstances the the creation staff it really is it really is a family and it really is special and it's important to just pick up and continue don't let it feel weird don't let it feel awkward just love whoever the hell is in front of you hold them tightly say something in their ear that means something to them and to you and uh you know n never let distance create distance in the heart you know it's just distance life pulls us in different directions but we always come back and we can always be there for each other when that person does call 10 days or 10 years or 10 hours it doesn't matter show up for each other give each other the space to screw up and come back to life because we're all going to do it we're all going to fall flat on our face and um Man, this podcast has made me slightly emotional, but I feel also uplifted, you know, like and, uh, think, yeah, think I mean, about I what do, Krista you know, is. It just, you know, it's, again, it's it's bigger than one person. It's bigger than one relationship. It's a, um, you know, as sick as it sounds, a, you know, an organic, you know, creature that exists because it grew naturally. It was never forced to to be something that it couldn't. It just became something magical from everyone that was part of it that yeah. helped grow it into this you know mutated being walking around with, with <laughs> you know, different legs like the, something from the thing but it's um get yeah, it it's it's that's what i miss most it's just all of it yeah it sense yeah no i get it look shameless plug come out and see chris and i and the rest of the team and the rest of the beautiful supernatural fandom at some of creation entertainments uh what are we calling it road so far yeah i think it was i think it was at one time j and j projects which sounded like a, a landscaping company but <laughs> <laughs> i i you know i think i brought up you know incorporate the road in there and they they kind of took that i think and and i think it's the road so far you know so it's you know because the car is kind of representative of you know not just a vehicle but you know it could be moving to a new place it could be you know picking up your your wife with your son at the hospital so there's yeah. so many you know things that go into the car and i think the car is you know was was a character on the show you know, sure. obviously, you know that it, it you know represented um you know so much about the show and from the music and that you know that had it happened in the car uh, to everything else so it's um yeah, I forgot the point, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. It's just nice to talk to you, buddy. Um, all right, come see us at the Creation Entertainment Road so hey, yeah, far. Road so show. far, that's what it was, dude. Sorry. We're in yeah, a we'll bunch in of cities we'll all over the United States and Canada. We're having a good time. We're bringing joy. We're sharing stories of defeat and triumph and everything in between. Uh, Schmelke, I love you, brother. It is a pleasure to talk to you, spend an hour with you and in, inside of our busy schedules, man, this has been amazing. And I only hope that when I hit stop recording that there's no technical difficulties and I can share this with the world. And when you mentioned that we had to redo it, um, I said, shit, there's no one I'd rather redo it with. So Same. I do Same. it again anytime, brother. All right, brother. All right, people. This is MC on the mic. That's Chris Schmelke. We will see you again soon. Peace. Peace. Don't forget to like and subscribe.